Thank you everybody for showing up today. I appreciate that so much. Uh, my name is Kelly J. Andrews, and you are in the command line, uh, a humble journey talk. Uh, just want to kind of say a couple things about it real quick. Um, there's not a whole lot of code. In fact, there's like none. So if you're looking for like a whole lot of coding or how to like hack the CLI or anything like that, this is not that kind of talk, okay? So if you want to get up and head out, find something that's more technical, feel free. If you need a brain break and want to learn about the history of the CLI and how it came to be and how it is what it is today, then you're in the right spot and we can get going. So last week, I, I probably used, I mean, even this morning, right? I'm using my computer terminal every single day, right? I open up uh, iTerm2, I type in npm install, I do git, I do all kinds of crazy stuff, right? With just this one little application that's a window that just is text, right? I could be moving files, I could be installing new applications, I could be building my code. It's, it's kind of a superhero in my, my point of view. It does everything I needed to do at the exact moment I wanted to do, and it lets me do all these things with just a few keystrokes. Some that I can make even shorter if I want to. But the CLI is so critical in everyday life, uh, uh, but we never really think about its history or how it got here, right? How did it become what it is today? How did it become this superhero? So I started doing a lot of research just to sort of learn about CLIs and how to build them and that kind of thing. And then I started to think about like, well, where did this actually come from? And I tend to go back a bit further than most people might. So to get a clearer picture, I think we need to go back near like over two centuries. Now why so early, right? I'm sure you're asking yourself that right now. And, and that's because in the 1800s, there were so many small like scientific, and I say small, but they were incrementally small, massive in what they ended up producing in the long term. But they, those things in the 1800s actually created what is now the CLI from the beginning. So forms of communication prior to like the 18th century consisted of things like smoke signals, uh, semaphore flags, right? Or maybe you've seen one of these, like an optical uh, code that they would use like in the Navy. Sometimes these are really effective, uh, but if the weather isn't clear, sometimes bad things happen. That's Titanic in case any Terrible joke, is it too soon? Seriously? Okay, so the communications of that time period were short distance, right? It was in the same kind of space. What we weren't able to do was talk to people far away, right? So in the 1780s, uh, a person by the name of Luigi Galvani, he figured out that he could take, uh, he could take a dead frog and make its legs twitch just by touching them with an assembly he made of two types of metals. So that discovery alone is what prompted Alessandro Volta to build upon those experiments. So somebody made a small discovery and that led to other discoveries being made, right? So what Volta did was he took saline soaked rags, <coughs> excuse me, I have had a cold for about a month, and I'm just on the tail end of it, so I apologize. <coughs> um, he took these uh, saline-soaked rags, and he, and he sandwiched them between stacks of copper and zinc. Okay, so that, that eventually became what's known as the voltaic pile, which is the description you see here. But you take those different rags and metals, and you put them all together, and that became a battery. He was literally able to produce a constant source of electricity, and he published those experiments in 1799. And maybe I'm stretching a bit, maybe I'm going far back, but without electricity, we would never have a computer, a CLI, none of that. So then, around the 1819 or so, there was electromagnetism was discovered. Um, and it was because someone figured out that you could take a needle, uh, a compass needle, past a voltaic pile, 
and the wires would be energized and the, the compass would move. So in 1820, an experimenter noted that uh, if you took a coil, a wire, uh, around a uh, iron bar, that you could actually make it pick up metal. Um, so they were doing it in, in, uh, with a horseshoe-shaped iron bar, coils, and the, the more coils they put on it, the stronger it would get, right? We kind of all understand electromagnetism at some, some level from fifth grade science even, right? But this was all new. They weren't sure how any of this stuff worked at that time, and they were just figuring it out. So from about around 1830, a scientist by the name of Joseph Henry perfected the electromagnet, basically, as we know it today. And what he did was he figured out that if you take the same thing they were doing and wrap the wires, instead of the iron bar, the wires could then be doubled up, tripled up, and it would become even more and more significant. He ended up inventing all kinds of great stuff uh, in the future. He actually, um, Joseph Henry was, uh, he was actually one of the first uh, board choices for the United States uh, Smithsonian Institution. So a lot of the stuff at the Smithsonian is from, um, just like carried over from this uh, gentleman, John Henry, uh, Joseph Henry, excuse me. He was also a, uh, during the Civil War, he served as a technical advisor to President Lincoln, um, and he, uh, he had a large group of volunteers that he organized all across the country to share weather observations, which ended up becoming the National Weather Service, right? So all kinds of things have happened over the years um, for this uh, Joseph Henry. But he, he and Volta's uh, pile, the voltaic pile, those two discoveries led to two distinct teams one in the US and one in Britain, uh, to pursue various ways that one could communicate using these two things, right? And what that eventually led us to was the telegraph. So what they started to understand is that when you took the wires and the electricity and you brought them around that compass, that needle would start swinging. So a magnetized needle clearly would move based off of these things. And that assembly ended up becoming what's known as a galvano, gal, galvano, galvanometer. I can never pronounce it right. It presented a, a pretty simple way to pass information with electricity. So it, it, the other, the class of machine was eventually named the needle telegraph. So the trick was, how do you encode information in just the swing of a needle? There were several varieties that popped up, some of them good, some of them not. Uh, the first one by a Pavel Schilling uh, used a single needle, and it could be swung left or right using current, and the letters were encoded based on the sequence. Right? So right, left, right, right, left, up, up, down, down, left, right, you know, that kind of thing. This was perhaps the first binary coding of, of text probably in history. So now we got these two gentlemen. Uh, this is uh, William Cook and Charles Waitstone. They invented and patented the first commercial telegraph. Now y'all are thinking, what about Morse and his stuff? I'll get to that in a second. But they gained early success, uh, success with their telegraph because they were able to communicate on the railroad system in Britain. Uh, so in the 1830s, each area operated on its own local time in Britain, um, and they started to change that uh, to be all synchronized, and that all came from the telegraph, right? Because now they could actually communicate between stations in an instant instead of having to send letters and it take hours or whatever. Um, but by 1855, these two gentlemen influenced society enough that London, uh, London time became Greenwich Mean Time in 1855. Um, so really the commercial, tele uh, commercial telegraphy, uh, it just revolutionized the world uh, communications because it laid the groundwork for like new uses in the second half of the century. Uh, it also led down the path to eventually what we know as the CLI. How, how exactly we'll get there. So their particular one used a series with five uh, needles, and each five would point basically down the path. So if you had, uh, in this particular instance, it's G, 
because those two things pointed towards uh, the middle. If the other one would move uh, in between it, it would point to K uh, or L, vice versa. Uh, but what you can see, um, so this was done with six different wires, uh, one for each of the gal uh, galvanometer, uh, the, the compass piece in the middle. And then uh, what you don't see on here are certain letters uh, because it's, there's only 24. So what that ended up to is this. Now these two gentlemen uh, may be perhaps caught the first murderer in Britain using a telegraph. Uh, so had the diamond shape, everything was there. Uh, but on January 1st, 1845, there was a, a woman by the name of Sarah Hart, and she was discovered that she had been killed, poisoned by hydrogen cyanide, which sounds pretty awful. Witnesses, uh, they noted they saw a man exit the house uh, just before her death, and police followed him all the way to the slough station, realizing that he'd caught a train. Now, prior to this, he was gone. He got off the train at the next stop, vanished. Nobody would know. But by this chance, that day, they had a new telegraph machine, so the officers were able to send a message to the next station, which I believe is Paddington. Um, and they, uh, a plainclothes officer tailed him and arrested him. So uh, it turned out he was, uh, it was just a, a criminal history guy, like, his name was John Taywell, uh, and he was uh, complete, the whole thing was completely sensationalized for Victorian audiences, but, um, yeah, so that, that is the first time an arrest actually occurred as a result of telecommunication technology. So the Telegraph gained huge publicity after that, and the case highlighted the benefits of rapid communication, and it helped ensure the, the subsequent commercial success of the actual Telegraph. So now, around the same time, um, in the US, a gentleman by the name of Samuel Morse uh, was painting. Yeah, he was actually painting, because he actually started as an artist. He didn't just create the Morse code. He did that after seeing um, some really amazing uh, electromagnet demonstrations in Europe. So what he became uh, famous for now is making the whole code using dots and dashes to represent the alphabet, right? Now we have a complete alphabet of 26 letters plus whatever else you wanted to add to it. So yeah, that spread even quicker and it, we went from sending a first message in 1844 to actually sending messages across the Atlantic in 1866. Point to point communication, just dots, dashes, but he managed to do one thing and he reduced everything down from like six wires and all these different uh, pieces and parts that could fail. He made one battery, one wire, and poles between the station. That was it. He simplified everything. So he took something complex and he worked it down into something simple and made it even more useful for everybody uh, to where they would use it. But it was not straight shot to get there. It was a long winding path. Many various uh, scientists all contributed in their own ways. Um, but, yeah, so I did my slides out of order. This is where I talk about he's an artist, I'm sorry. Uh, so while working as a painter, he did actually labor to instill in his fellow, uh, fellow Americans the idea of the vital role of the arts in the development of the United States. Uh, but there was no steady patronage, so he gave it up. I, I actually can vouch for that. I moved into tech because I was trying to be a musician. So it's kind of the same thing. Um, there's better work in science, better money in science, that's for sure, sometimes. Uh, so anyway, so he, uh, he ended up putting, the, putting that whole thing out. But while dots and dashes were growing in popularity, science didn't stop, right? We didn't stop at just waiting for Morse code to figure all his stuff out. Now, this is uh, Royal Earl House, and what he did was he said, no, 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 forget dots and dashes, let's make it actually print Roman letters. So he was an inventor that was born in Vermont uh, around 1814. Uh, and essentially, he invented a keyboard and a single line of insulated conductors, uh, magnets, type wheels, all kinds of cool stuff that allowed several stations to be interconnected, and then you could punch in some keys and, and send a message across the wire to wherever you wanted at that point. 
So that, that invention was first put in observation, operation and exhibited at the Mechanics Institute in New York in 1844. Uh, it was the first of its kind, and it had a speed transmission of over 50 words, right? 50 words a minute. That, that doesn't sound fast, but in that time, that's unbelievably fast, right? So uh, it was really cool. It, they actually, Morse tried to get his stuff into uh, Mr. House's, uh, into his uh, teletype machine, the telegraph, printing telegraph. He tried to put it, but he actually sued him and won, so he couldn't, um, which I thought was kind of an interesting little tidbit about the two. So uh, Morse was trying to ride his coattails, it sounds like. Uh, so yeah, so this is a type of printing telegraph. Uh, it used a style of a piano uh, for, the, for the letters and, and everything. It had 28 keys and a 56 character type wheel. The, the type wheel would be synchronized basically with the two stations. So as you would type into one, the other one would fire up and start uh, creating the same thing. All right, so we're almost to the point where this starts to connect to the actual CLI, but I feel like some of these ancestors makes sense because we didn't just start with a computer. We didn't just start with a command line or an interface. We started so much further back and all of those things have helped shape where we're headed. So teletypes, like telegraphs, have, have all been a thing of the past. They fell, fall, they fell out of favor long ago, um, but that creation led to another invention known as what's called the telex or the teletype or TTY which is something if you do something, like if you use PuTTY or any of those, uh, any TTY uh, named, so named um, applications for your command line, that's the same kind of thing. It's, it's the same kind of point-to-point -point communication and it's named after these machines. So this is Donald Murray and he was an electrical engineer and he invented the telegraphic typewriter system that uh, using an extended uh, code that was a direct ancestor of the teleprinter. He, um, you can basically call this guy the, the father of the TypeScript, uh, or the typewriter, sorry. Type, I've been doing a lot of TypeScript, so it's in my mind. Uh, Murray's system became the International Telegraph uh, Alphabet Number no. 2, or ITA2, uh, or also known as Murray Code. It was supplanted by the ASCII in 1963. So it took over like a century for his stuff to go away. Um, it was pretty, pretty popular for a very long time. But what it took away um, was the operator error and fatigue of having to type things and, and read things and keep everything in sync or is, uh, figure out a code, right? All those sorts of things that these other people had to do before, he's starting to remove that. So now the device is taking most of the wear and tear instead of the user. So I believe, yeah, so this is what these look like. And you would have one machine, and you'll see these, these were used like in the Navy and a lot of armed services because they're secure. It's basically one to one. Um, yeah, he said even, even until 2013, right? So nine years ago, this technology was still in use. Um, but you would type on one, and it would, it would, you would see it type out on the, on the paper, and then it would relay that message to another machine, which would just spit out the same message. So he, uh, he kind of goes on that for a while, but we can skip this. Let's see. Yeah, so Murray introduced a couple other things that you may know, uh, CR and LF. Everybody know what those, those stand for? Right, carriage return, line feed. That's been around since the 19th century. So that, is, uh, that one's not going away. But the teletype machine and teleprinters, uh, even teleprinters are used in aviation right now, right? If you've ever been sitting at a gate and they're waiting for the papers to be reprinted, usually it's a teletype machine that's printing out those out and they tear them off. It's like a big dot matrix printer almost. Uh, they're mostly connected over phone lines, um, but if you wanna see teletypes in use, heavy usage, the, the movie Good Morning Vietnam, they're all over, right? Everything he gets in Vietnam is through a TTY machine. You know, print stuff printing out and they tear it off the machine and go read the news, right? So it's an example of what I would call a hard copy terminal. This is where we're starting to make the connection into our, our friend, the CLI. Telex had to exist 
before we ever got to the next pieces. So this is what's called a uh, Hollerith uh, tabulation uh, machine. And during the 1880s, the engineer Herman Hollerith, uh, he devised a set of machines for compiling data from the United States Census. So the United States government helped out a little bit here, where they commissioned something to be able to take the census and add it up faster, because there was a lot there and a lot to do. So um, what it would do, they would punch data into a card, the tabulator for reading cards would sum up the information, and a sorting box would sort the cards for further analysis later. Now that tabulator is uh, shown in the, center, uh, in the photograph here. It actually won a gold medal at the 1889 World's Fair in Paris and was used successfully to count the 19, 1890 census results. Pretty neat. His inventions actually formed the starting point of a little company we might know called IBM, which was a cool little tidbit. Okay, so these two replaced what was uh, the Hollerith counter with what was called the Univac. Right, so the Univac was gonna be a, a more of a personal computer. It was still huge, but it was, the whole idea was that they would be able to sell more of them and they'd be more portable because they weren't as big as a room. They were getting smaller and movable, right? So in 48, um, they were actually contract, contracted uh, to build a machine for the Census Bureau. And then in, by 51, they, uh, uh, they finally had one and they were able to um, use that to tabulate part of the 1950 census and the entire 54 economic census. So throughout the 50s, UNIVAC played a huge role in, in like economic surveys and other like major government uh, comp computation type stuff. So it would work with repetitive but intricate mathematics um, just to kind of keep all those surveys in check. And then it was known as the first civilian computer, right? So it was, but it was a key part of the dawn of the computer age. Just despite early delays, UNIVAC actually at the Census Bureau was a huge success. Early computer terminals like those for UNIVAC 1 and UNIVAC 2, which eventually replaced it, were much different than we know today. They served a similar purpose where they would send and receive data from the computer. They were large, bulky, slow, all those kinds of things, right? But early terminals actually would use like punch cards as well to add the, add the data. Some of them would also use paper tape. So let's talk about punch cards and how, those, um, how these machines could actually create, uh, create them for users too. So my, I had a friend in college, he was older, a professor, he was the dean of music. And he had a band called Plato in the Western Tradition that was, uh, it was interesting, right? Very postmodern um, kind of stuff. But he, uh, in the 60s, experimented, 50s and 60s, experimented a lot with music. And the way he would do punch cards is he would punch it, stuff it in a mail, flick it, send it to MIT, and like six, eight weeks later, get a response back from them. Right? That was the only way to do anything. So he was doing this all the time, like weekly, because he wanted to hear what electronic music he could create with a computer. Really crazy stuff, but the fact that he, like their, their, uh, their, system, their whole school couldn't afford one, they couldn't get one, the only place to do this was through MIT, it's crazy. These punch cards though were used even still 10 years ago in an election, if we all remember those stories. So punch cards haven't just gone away. They've been around, uh, but I think we're finally sort of past them. But they, uh, they definitely were a big business for quite a long time. So we're gonna talk about uh, the Frieden Flexo Writer, which was a teleprinter and heavy duty electric typewriter. Um, so this was capable of being driven not only by a human, but also automatically, including the direct attachment to a computer and use of uh, paper tape as well. So I was talking about that just a second ago. Elements of this design date to the 20s, uh, and variants of this machine produced until the 1970s. These machines were found 
a variety of uses during the evolution of office equipment in the 20th century. So including uh, being among the first electric typewriter, computer input, and output devices. So this would actually uh, predates like the modern word processing um, tools that we have today. But this would actually create, you could punch in and create paper tape or punch cards from this machine as opposed to, again, having to do them by hand and feeling the fatigue from having to do that kind of stuff. So this would actually create things and you could type it in and then run the thing into the computer, run the card into the computer and it would do whatever you needed it to do. So then, now we're getting into like, we're still in like the 50s area. And the addition of video uh, would lead to terminals that use like CRT monitors. They would display graphical data instead of just text. Uh, terminals were connected to a mainframe uh, and had a monochromatic screen of like green or amber. I had something similar to this when I was a kid. Um, it wasn't connected to a mainframe, but definitely similar. So these terminals differed from PCs of today by the fact that they didn't really do a whole lot, but just sat there. They would run stuff on a different machine and show it to you. They couldn't create a lot of that stuff on, the own, on their own. It was more like an analog TV set. Uh, and you don't really see these around much anymore at all. But the terminal itself didn't really change for a long time. Now, now we focus, uh, we change our focus from hardware over to software. So we have computer terminals. They don't do what we know them to do today, but that's it's because they were different. Like computers didn't have all these things. They didn't even have the software to run what we do today. So early terminals were interacting directly with a mainframe. They just were a resident monitor. They'd clean up tasks. They would make sure things happened in the right order, that kind of thing. But in 1964, the initial planning and development of software that essentially influenced all operating since its creation started at MIT. So Multics used a single level hierarchical store for everything from files to process memory and created the idea of dynamic linking, right? This allows for applications to be linked at runtime instead of creation of the executable. It supported online reconfiguration uh, CPUs, memory banks, disk drives, and it supported multiple CPUs, one of the first OSs to ever do that. Now, Multics was shut down uh, finally October 30th of 2000, and then in 2006, the source code was re released as free software. But we're getting to the good part. So, this is Luis Pouzon, I think. Again, I'm not good on pronouncing things. Um, having participated in the design of the compatible time-sharing system at MIT, uh, he wrote a program for it called RunCom. Now, around 63 to 64, RunCom permitted the execution of commands contained within a folder and could be considered the ancestor of the command line interface and shell. So the acronym RC that we see in a lot of places, RC files, RC this, RC that, they're all over the place in your hidden files on Mac and everything. Uh, it's actually a remnant of RunCon from the 60s. So that RC file that you see has been around for decades. Now he was one that actually coined the term shell for a command language interpreter uh, separate from the kernel. He also had another really, really big claim uh, to the internet fame. Does anybody know? Maybe, no? TCP IP, he figured out how to do packets. You know now? Yeah, it's, uh, he, he, he's one of the early grandfathers of the internet, so it's uh, pretty cool stuff. But yeah, he, to he coined the term shell. Now he didn't necessarily build one, he built Runcom, which is similar but different. This woman, however, she developed the first Multic shell. This is Glenda Schroeder, and she took his, uh, Pouzon's concepts and she implemented them into Multics. This Multic shell, I can't express how important this thing is, it's the predecessor to every Unix shell like we've made, right? It's the first one that was able to separate things into like an operating system and runtime environment as opposed to working everything directly onto the, onto the kernel. She also wrote the first mail program. Like if you need a female figure in tech to look up to that she's another one. 
right? There's, there's more out, and she, amazing stuff. So go do some reading on her and find out what all she's built. It's pretty cool. So once Multic Shell was created, it was four years later that Unix was actually uh, made at Bell Labs. So this is Ken Thompson, and he originally wrote Unix in assembly, uh, but by version four, they rewrote it in C uh, because assembly's crazy. And then, be, but during the 70s and 80s, Unix, Unix influenced academia heavily. Uh, large scale adoption in the late 80s and 90s, 90% 90 of the world's supercomputers still use Unix in Unix like systems. So Unix gave us tools like make, ed, sh, cp, ls, grep, find, manuals. Multics and Unix shells were both jumping points off, jumping off points for the shells we have today and the direct predecessor of our current COI. These are all the different flavors of Unix. And that, I believe, can't see my, yeah, Unix is very, the top one, and right above that is Multics. Got cut off a little bit. So, essentially, those at MIT that developed Multics is, all of this came from that. So it's just mind boggling how insanely awesome some of that stuff is. So we're in the age of the 70s and 80s where these are the kind of mainframe computers and home PCs now we're seeing, right? So this is from an incredible movie called War Games where you can see these older computers used in different capacities. Um, but a couple of interesting points on that. They, uh, there was a real news report and it convinced the writers that they could actually do this movie because they thought it was really far-fetched uh, they thought it was, you know, nobody would actually buy the entire U.S. military being fooled by some kid. And then they, uh, then they saw this actual real news story and they were like, oh, it was Walter Cronkite read a story about um, the U.S. believing it was under nuclear attack from the Soviet U Union, all because of a simulation tape was still, simulation tape was still in a machine. So they said, let's keep writing. Now, Matthew Broderick also had to get really good at Galaga. That's not really important to the CLI, but I just thought that was kind of interesting. Okay, so this is the Altair 8800. And there, he's actually programming right now a game that you could play with it where you would try to flip switches to chase the dot. But it took flipping these nodes <laughs> to program Right, and this was the console, right? This is how he's programming the machine. He's interacting with the machine using these switches, flipping them up and down. So in the 70s, as software improved and hardware was becoming more portable, that all kinds of hobbyist computer operators started to grow in, in great numbers. One hobbyist uh, at that time read an article about this particular machine, and he told uh, his, he and his partner told the manufacturer that they'd been working to develop Altair Basic. Uh, BASIC is an old language that I actually started on back in the 80s. Uh, it had an interpreter, interpreter for it, and it was just go-to and loops and look it up, it's interesting. But So they said they had a BASIC interpreter specifically for this, this machine. It was actually a complete lie. They didn't have anything. Uh, what they wanted to see is if, um, is if they were even interested, and they were really interested. So they wrote it in two weeks. Right, sound familiar? A lot of software gets written in really short amounts of time, including this. Um, so Altair Basic, it was met with open arms, distributed, and then other hobbyists were doing some of their own distribution of the whole thing too. So it prompted one of the partners to write an open letter to all of these hobbyists, explaining how new software would disappear if the developers had no incentive to write it, and that paying for them should be the norm. That was 1976. Um, and those two students actually ended up in Bellevue and created Microsoft. So we can thank this guy for getting paid to write software. It's one of the few great things that we think he's done, probably. Uh, but, but seriously, the Altair, he, they, they stole his code. And he wrote a letter to these other people like, hey, guys, don't, don't, don't do my stuff. Like, no, it's interesting. I just think it's crazy. Like, that's how, that's how they would do stuff. But, um, Okay, one last thing. Uh, if you've ever written really crappy software, this is one of uh, Bill Gates' first. Um, this is called Donkey uh, Bass. So if you've ever seen it, just in doing the research, I came up with this. So don't be afraid if you've written bad software, we all have. Um, that's really bad. 
Anyways, I'm sure it was great in the 80s. All right, let me, uh, okay. In 85, the software development that, that came out that's really important was obviously Windows, right? So Windows changed sort of how we were doing things. Also, Apple Macintosh had a, a user interface that was graphical. Now, this still relied heavily on DOS, uh, but the ease of use absolutely captured and captivated users. So a decade later, however, from 85, things started to change. Yeah. <clears throat> What's a good tech talk without this slide somewhere? So I just, I'm gonna try to do that from now on. All my slides will, all my talks will have this in here somewhere. Um, so the initial design and planning of Windows 95 was, it can be all the way, goes all the way back to like March of 92, uh, just after the release of 3.1. Uh, so they had like Windows work groups 3.11, Windows NT 3.1, they were still all in development. Um, but they knew they wanted to get to a high-end operating system based on Windows NT. Um, so the later strategy was to develop a 32-bit underlying kernel and file system, all new stuff, right? None of this existed, but the shift changed. They were, they were actually using the graphic user interface still in 95. It still ran DOS operating system, and it displayed the graphical universe interface and they're merging the two together, right? So it's like, ah. So Windows 95 was really bad at doing it. It was revolutionary, but it was just two, it still was like two separate things. It wasn't really until like Windows 98, DOS was gone. Um, but yeah, like they would run a 32-bit Windows application and DOS would still like run that application. It was really weird. Um, so finally, we, we kind of got rid of DOS and now, we're caught up, right? And the CLI today is just an application, right? There's nothing there, it's just an app. But you open it up and it gives you access to everything, which is really super powerful. So it's, um, yeah, it starts up a shell, you work directly on your machine, just like a telegraph, a TTY, a terminal, any of those old things, it is point-to-point -point communication. You're literally user, computer, shell. So it's a superhero to me, right? It helps me every day. All of these different commands that I run on a regular basis wouldn't happen without it. So what's the point? Well, not everything is finished when you start, right? We wouldn't have NPM, Git, curl if it wasn't for Volta coming up with an electric, you know, an electric battery. So you may be writing things just to solve small problems that you have today, but 10, 20, 30 years from now, that becomes something, right? Because somebody takes that and goes, oh, I can take this and I can manipulate it and do this with it. And then it continues to grow and change and build like ripples. So while you may not be starting out to build a CLI, start somewhere, because that somewhere will actually lead to something new. Okay, so we've got about 15 minutes and I have one more thing I wanna do, but I'm gonna need a couple of people. So I never quite felt like I got deep enough. That's the technical talk. So if you, if you wanna head out and get a drink, fine, but I got a little bit more I'm gonna show you. Uh, which might be some interesting that people might like. So uh, there, I think there's another point-to-point -point range um, communication device that kind of started all of it, but I need a couple volunteers to help me prove it. Anybody? Gant? Scott? Come on. Everybody give them a round of applause. All right, and that is what was called the 10-can envelope. Stay right there. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When Slack's down, oh, stay over. There. You're gonna to want to stay over there. Over here. Okay. Uh, okay. You're gonna to want to go right here. Okay. All right. Now, if you you want to pull it nice and tight. Now I have buttons in the bottom too. You'll notice, uh -huh. just to help with the resonation. But if you get your, just talk right in here. And then you need to put it right up there. Can you hear it? Does it work? Okay, 
But that's audio, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and we need written text. Okay. So can you write something down? Don't tell me or anybody else. Okay. Gotcha. Just, uh, just hang, hang tight for a second. Got it? Yeah, go ahead. All right, can we fold it or anything? Or? Uh, yeah, I'll fold it this way. I want to make sure it's nice and small. One second. Too many things in my hands. Okay. It's got to be the right size. Here. And then, um, you want to hang on to it? Sure, whatever you want. All right. So, um, <laughs> here you go. Now, if you notice, it's already missing. It's gone. <laughs> so we walk it all the way down here. Yeah. Grab that. What? And then uh, unfold that and read it. Let me see what it says. Fold it very, very well. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. If you fold it really small, it goes through the screen. Yeah, yeah right. it doesn't fit otherwise. Right. 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 I'm so nervous. Something. That's what you told me to Cla write. Classy joke. Yeah. Classy joke. And ladies and gentlemen, the first ancestor to the CLI. That's fantastic. The cups and string. That's it. Thank you so much, everyone. I appreciate you coming, and uh, enjoy your break, and we'll, we'll see you around tonight. <laughs>